You are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fire University. Today, uh, this is a topic that has been asked about quite frequently from many of you in the audience. I I brought two experts in this topic area today, Dr. Craig Harper and Dr. Bronson Strickland, to talk about what can you do when you don't have access or cannot burn for some reason or another, but you're still interested in improving habitat, namely for deer and turkey. That's what we get asked about quite a bit. So uh, Craig, Bronson, thanks for coming. Really excited about the topic today. Glad to be here, Marcus. I'm a little confused, though. You said experts and then followed up with Craig Harper. Well, he did say when you can't use fire. So (laughs) there you go, Bronson. There's your cue in right there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I also said that I was really excited and we're going to not be talking about fire. So it's maybe some inaccuracies in that opening. You're going to struggle through this one. Evidently, yeah. Since yeah, fire just, won't be a topic. I'm just going to sit he, he back. He him getting two of us to help. <laughs> but yeah. you're right, Marcus, that this is a topic we get all the time. We certainly uh, stress the importance of fire. and uh, But there's so many people, uh, especially in my neck of the woods, that lease land, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be from a timber company or whoever. And that's just not an option on the table for them. So, yeah, I think this will be a good discussion for those people. Yeah, I agree. Before the show, we were talking about the reasons that people don't or can't burn differ, some depending on where you're from. But here in the Pine Belt, you're certainly right. Large amount of the acreage is owned by a a timber company or or, uh, something that's being leased to hunt. And that's certainly an, an, an important consideration when you're thinking about managing habitat and uh, what you have access to and what you don't. So it's a good point. It's a, it's a good thing that we're talking about, oh gosh, what do you do when you can't burn? You know, intuitively that says, wow, a lot more people are burning today. And we consider that very highly when alternatively you could say, uh, well, if you can't burn, I guess you do what everybody else does north of Tennessee. Because North of Tennessee, by and large, there's not that many people burning as there are below the Mid-South area. Uh, that has a lot to do with the, the states, the regulations that are in place, and of course, the culture. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Deep South, for sure, with the uh, pine-dominated systems, have uh, a much stronger culture in use of fire than when you get north of there. And so... Uh, of course, there's a whole bevy of things that can be done when you can't use fire, but I think it's good that we're getting these questions, well, what if I can't burn, uh, highlighting how many people now are beginning to burn more than they did just a few years ago. Yeah, I agree, and also it tells you people understand or realize that fire is probably something that they want to be able to do but for some reason or another it's not accessible so even that is telling us that people are starting to value how important fire can be in your habitat management program so well uh, i don't want to go too much further without just going on and getting into it so what if if you're in a situation let's start with the the situation that's 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 uh so common in the deep south in the pine belt if you're you know a a 
not a landowner and you're leasing land, but you're still interested in making habitat improvements for most of those people who are leasing, I guess, for, for deer and turkey. What, what are some things, some options that those people do have? Well, I, I guess, Marcus, where, where I typically start with people is let's check some boxes first before we get into maybe the limited range of things they can do, quote, habitat wise, let's start with some real basic stuff that applies across the board to everybody. Uh, first of all, let's, let's look at what is your deer density. That is something, obviously, if you're leasing land, you're harvesting deer. So that is something you can control and manipulate. And that's going to start with uh, data collection. So you're going to be have to collect harvest data, looking at carcass condition, body weight, comparing that to your neighbor, to your region, et cetera, getting expert opinion from biologists in, in your area. Are you above average, below average? You know, do you think you have a density problem? So that that's always going to be uh, an issue, whether you can include fire or not. Uh, the other thing that is a very common practice, even if you lease land, timber company or otherwise is most people give you some area that may not be enough but they give you some area for food plots and so i try to to work with people and getting a soil test you know all the stuff we teach and talk about managing a productive cool season food plot first and then move into if you can warm season food plots which is often neglected by a lot of people during the summer, or are they growing high quality forages at that time? Mm -hmm. That is typically where I, I start with a lot of people. Then if we can, you know, what are the constraints they have about habitat? Uh, can they do anything at all? Well, it might be things like daylighting roads, incorporating rather than uh, uh, an old field or opening. Now let's incorporate a disc. And let's make sure we cultivate, you know, naturally occur uh, occurring forages and get those in the system. That, that is typically where uh, I start with most people, Marcus, in, in my neck of the woods here in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that those are good points. And I'm curious, Bronson, and your experience when, when uh, you're working with these people, typically how much of their lease is in openings where they have a, you know, the option to do those things? probably less than 2%, maybe 1%. Yeah, so that's not, not enough from my perspective. I don't own the land, but just from a deer management perspective and providing food, you mm -hmm. know, not enough. So that's going to be a limitation. Hence, one of the reasons why collect harvest data, look at your carcass condition and, and get your, your density managed according to the, you know, the carrying capacity of the property. Mm-hmm. I think it might be interesting to contrast that with what if you're not focused on deer and you were instead interested or also interested in turkeys? How does that change things? Um, I, I guess for me, even though I obviously don't get that question as much as you, you guys do, um, it, it's probably going to be more of, let's say, if they were turkey centric and not deer centric. It might be less on the openings that you have for food plots and just disking and managing succession in, in, in that format. So just try to maximize those openings a, as much as you can. And you know, Marcus, this is something that's probably really boring for people to hear, but, but it's so true, is you really, whether it be turkey or deer or whatever, um, every site's gonna be different and you really have to get back to the whole, what are the limiting factors mm -hmm. for that property? And, and also thinking about getting on Google Earth or whatever and looking at your neighbors at a much bigger scale, especially if you're a sub thousand acre property, what is the landscape like? What is limiting around you? And then what are the things you can do to augment at a bigger scale the, the habitat in your area? So I know we always say limiting factors and plug in the lowest hole in the bucket and so forth, but we always say it because it's so important. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good points. So I guess if we're going to contrast 
that to some of the properties you or the uh, the people that you often work with, Craig. How does that change in terms of what you're thinking about when you're working with someone who maybe they do own their land, but they have a, other limitations that's keeping them from using fire? Well, it's a different world. Um, below here, and I'm talking about below Tennessee, and you get into the uh, areas that are predominantly pine forested, and you have these large land holdings that lease acreage, as, as Bronson was referring to, the, the leaseholders really are restricted in what they're allowed to do. Um, but when you get above that, and you're not talking about leaseholders of pine lands where you're, you're hamstrung as to what you can do, your options are really open. And so you have much more open ground. The, the landscape may, well, obviously it's, it's the same as, as areas, it may be, in, as areas where you can use fire. I mean, you can use fire in Pennsylvania. You can use fire in Virginia or Indiana or uh, Michigan, where, where, wherever. And so you're talking about restrictions in what perhaps there may be uh, state or, or regional uh, ordinances, people might just not feel comfortable in using fire. In my opinion, that's the number one thing that prevents most people from using fire. They aren't comfortable with it. And so, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, there, there should be uh, some apprehension and a bit of fear, whether it be for using fire or climbing on a tractor. And so that's, that's something that I talk to people about when, when they haven't uh, use fire or, you know, or apprehensive to do so. But okay, that's fine. Let's get past that and say, okay, what can you do other than burning? Um, well, what is fire? It's, it's a disturbance technique. And so there's lots of other disturbance techniques that a landowner can use to improve their property for, for deer or turkeys or, you know, wh whatever the, the case may be. Uh, of course, there are advantages to fire, but you still have uh, mechanical disturbances, whether that's with a, a tractor and a disc or a bush hog or, uh, of course, chemical disturbance. That's one that we use as much or, or more than anything in, a, in uh, uh, accompanying, accompaniment with fire is, uh, is herbicides. So there's lots of things that can be done. Of course, in forested settings, uh, chainsaws are, are always used. And so when we manage, for example, a forested area with fire, we're doing so with cutting or killing trees. And so if you can't use fire, then you're just having to go back in more frequently to kill or cut additional stems, whereas we can use fire to kill those much more efficiently. And so if someone can't use fire, they're simply using a chainsaw you know, more frequently than, than they would otherwise. And then in field settings, instead of burning, you might, uh, of course, disc. A lot of times, according to the structure of the field, you might need to, to mow or spray the field prior to disking, according to how much uh, biomass is on the field. So there you have mechanical disturbance along with chemical disturbance that you're using in conjunction that is uh, very effective. And so where we might go into an old field setting and do a lot of spot spraying in June or July and then come back three to four weeks later and burn those dead spots, you can do the same thing with, with a disc. And you can wait until late winter just prior to spring green up it's very easy then to disc that material as opposed to earlier in the fall that you would not want to because of the cover that is remaining in the field over winter time. And of course, it is not typically a good <laughs> situation to go in spring or early summer and, and be disking, especially on the scale that you might be disking because of, of nesting and brooding and fawning and, and that kind of thing. But uh, you, we're just talking about transitioning our types of disturbance from fire to other things. And when you're outside of the restrictions of leased land, then essentially you can do, you know, hopefully anything else. Yeah. Very interesting. So 
Uh, you talked about some, you know, there are advantages to fire and there are certainly advantages to some of those other things. Are, are there things, let's say, in the, the forest setting that you were describing with some of those forest and improvement practices using the chainsaw versus using the chainsaw with, with fire? What, what are you losing, I guess, when you take fire out of it, aside from logistically, like you you talked about being, you know, having to go back in more frequently. So are, are there other things that you're losing in that setting? Yes. With regard to uh, deer or turkeys, um, you're, you're losing forbs. And so with a chainsaw, you're creating or enabling additional sunlight to come into the stand. But if you're not consuming that leaf litter with fire and enabling the seed bank to germinate, then what you're left with is predominantly woody sprouting. And you know that's not bad, but overall that's not as good as if you can have that strong forb component, mm -hmm. which overall has increased nutrition for deer, also has better brooding structure for, for turkeys, has better uh, seed producing uh, plants. Many, you know, many forb species produce a lot of seed that various birds eat. And also are very important with regard to supporting uh, uh, insects. So insects are strongly tied to many forb species. And so you're talking about both food and cover resources for these animals at different times of the year. And so that's you know another reason why fire is very important and can be uh, a, a real added benefit when you're managing some of these areas. And, and you, you, don't, you don't get that when you can't use fire. Unless you unless you literally go in and and you know scratch the ground after you've cut the trees and then the, with that soil disturbance, of course you're going according to how much sunlight you have, you're going to have a flush of forbs, but but not without that. Okay, so in the same scenario, if you start using herbicides to control some of the woody resprouting, are you still going to be limited by forbs? I mean, what what kind of plant community would develop if you were using cutting in tandem with herbicide? Um, you may, according to the leaf litter and how much is there, but that leaf litter is what's suppressing the germination of the seed bank. And that's where the fire is so valuable. Similar to a field situation, if you have a, a field that is covered in thatch, then you're probably going to perpetuate perennial grasses. And it's not until you disc the soil that you get a strong forb response uh, similar. Well, if you have strong perennial grasses and you burn, then you're probably going to maintain a lot of perennial grass cover. Uh, your time in a burning might influence that. But even when you're uh, able to use fire in field situations, the addition of herbicides and or soil disturbance through discing can be very important in terms of changing that plant community into something that's more favorable. So in that field setting, if you don't have access to fire, or don't use fire, are you losing anything by only using discing and herbicides that you would have gained by having fire involved? Well, you're going to probably have a little more time on your hands with regard to uh, woody encroachment and a certain amount of woody encroachment is is good uh, whether that's for a variety of non-game songbirds or uh, shade for turkeys loafing in a field during the summertime uh, deer bedding sites within uh, an old field the the variable structure that that brings about that makes it very attractive for for brooding and so uh, all, of, all of that comes together. You can keep that knocked back with fire on a certain fire regime. Whereas when you allow that to develop without using fire, that can be difficult to get a disc over. And so that means you're having to go in and do a little more grunt work, if you will, with a chainsaw or spot spray in some of those woody sprouts. So, you know, you're you're manipulating it in different ways and you still can get a very good forb response without firing fields if you're spraying 
and, this, and in particular, using spot spraying to kill uh, problematic or undesirable species. And in those dead spots, once that thatch begins to decompose, then you're gonna have a flush from the seed bank. But fire, of course, is more efficient and helps that along. Okay. Hey, Craig, this is uh, not, not meaning to, to be a gotcha question here. Um, Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else does. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I didn't mean gotcha. I know you don't have data in front of you, so I'm going to ask you to kind of think back. Uh, do you have a lot of situations where you've worked with properties that did just what you're talking about in terms of they never incorporated fire, but utilized the, the techniques you're talking about and, and got a favorable response and were satisfied with changes in deer and or turkey or both uh, years down the road? Oh, absolutely. Uh, many, many. Um, one of the best examples I can think of right off the top of my head is, is working with some folks in the mountains of North Carolina and because of their timber interest and because they just didn't really like the idea of, of using fire that much. Uh, they used old field management with herbicides and disking, uh, a lot of timber management, but it was primarily uh, silvicultural harvest, uh, as well as uh, a fair amount of forest and improvement and a lot of food plots. And they went from, you know, the ubiquitous quote scrub buck in about 2006 until about 2000, I think it was 2012 or so, uh, killed the first 170 class buck. So, I mean, absolutely you can do that without fire. It's just that fire makes it easier and fire gives you more options to get to where you wanna go and fire can make things better than it would without it. I, I was hoping you would say that, Craig, just so people could hear that there are some great examples. If right. you are not able to use it, they still were able to accomplish their objectives. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really interesting. And along those same lines, uh, I'm thinking through, it, particularly in the forested setting, when you're talking about losing forbs, and if you if you don't use fire, it, does that make it more important to have a a strong food plot program where you're going to be using forbs to some degree in that that program? The food plot certainly help, but you don't have to have it as long as you have enough open land, and you're managing the early successional vegetation appropriately, and and that's really strongly advocating forbs in those areas and not grasses. D deer don't eat grass unless they're about to starve or it's wheat or oats or, you know, grass in, in, in March and April when it's just, you know, popping out. Uh, relatively speaking, very low with regard to nutritional value. And you get an area, it's all thick, full of grass. The, the quality for, for broods goes way down the clutter at ground level is such that broods can't hardly get, a, get around in it. Uh, even, you know, other species, uh, you know, Bob White or whatever the case may be, you get this clutter that's at ground level and, and the mobility is down, the food value is low, the, the cover is, is strongly reduced. And all of a sudden those animals are using around the edge of the field. And of course, if you read game management, Leopold called them edge species, but that's because of the landscape, the agricultural landscape that he was working in, not because those animals needed an edge. I think you could easily, uh, and I, I certainly have, make the argument that there actually is no such thing as an edge species. What that means is those species need have a certain structural requirement. And if you are not managing a field appropriately, such that the turkey broods or the bobwhite or the rabbits or whatever the case may be is not as prevalent in the middle of the field as along the edge of the field, then that just means you're not managing the field appropriately for that species. 
So in your experience, uh, when you're not managing the failed whale, is that because of a particular problem or does it vary widely across landowners? What, what well, are you? Well, yeah, I mean, it could be for any number of, of reasons. For example, how are you going to manage the structure in a, in a soybean field? You, you can't. How are you going to manage the structure in a hay field? Uh, you know, so, no, the, you know, I'm not talking about production agriculture. I'm talking about, okay, I, I you know, people who have made the decision that uh, they're going to manage their, their fields by mowing. Uh, you know, it, it, it is, it's going to get away from us if, if we don't get that mowed down, you know, whatever the case may be. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous for people to go out and mow their fields, not just annually, but a lot of times, two or three times a year. And so, well, well no, you don't have that structure out there that's going to hold and support those species that we just mentioned in the middle of the field. And so that's why you find them around the edge. I think a uh few people were squirming around in their seat when you started bringing up mowing. <laughs> Along those same lines, I guess, what if we're thinking about turkeys, so uh, Bronson, if, if you want to add something, you're welcome to, even though I changed the subject back to turkeys. Uh, I, I, I and, did have one <laughs> quick thing. Okay. I'd like to get Craig's two cents on, um, and, and maybe I, I'm indeed thinking of kind of a, a normal situation in the deep south where the the amount of openings you have is very limited so i mean literally for maybe every couple hundred acres you got an acre um and then assuming food is limited um would you rather see that person do one acre of food plot or manage the opening for naturally occurring vegetation that's up to their objectives if you're wanting to shoot a deer over that opening in November, <laughs> you might want to plant some crimson clover, some brassine clover and oats. <laughs> uh, they're not going to be strongly attracted to warm season forbs that was providing the highest quality nutrition from April through July in November. So that that's that's where there's trade-offs and, and there's really nothing these folks can do about that on you know these large uh lease holdings if, if they don't have the ability to manage much of the property but most of these people are in those leases because they want to shoot something and so with that in mind plant something in those openings that's going to be strongly attractive and shoot something. There's nothing wrong with that. We shouldn't apologize about that. You know, deer need to be shot. There's there's too many of them in places. And people like to shoot turkeys when they're strutting across a small food plot. You know, I, I do. <laughs> Y'all do, I've watched you. Yeah. Also, I'll, although I've watched Marcus miss one, but then he got it on the, on the wing, you know, when he got out there. Just yeah, we, we don't talk about that one, Craig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll joke in the side, uh, don't be surprised that the deer or the number of turkeys on that property, uh, the, the, the quality of the deer, the size of the deer, or the number of the turkeys on that property then is not as great as what you would like it to be because, you know, both of those are what we call generalist species. You'll find them in wide open landscapes or in totally closed canopy forest landscapes, but when you have a, a, a good percentage and a nice arrangement of openings in your forested uh, areas as, as well as, you know, brushy areas, et cetera, then the habitat quality, which means the amount and quality of food, the amount and quality of cover during different times of the year are increased. And then you can see more robust populations of those species. And so, you know, you can have a hundred deer per square mile in a, in a pine forest, but I doubt many of them are going to score 150 inches. So along the same lines of this discussion, what Bronson just asked you, Craig, or I guess this is open to both of you. Are there, if you have only a couple percent of your 
land is accessible and openings and it's you, you don't own the the forests are there food plot prescriptions that you could use to optimize you know the the attraction during uh during deer season and then maybe uh some attraction during turkey season and then poult rearing and and fawn you know uh, fawning areas or you know what i guess how do how do people deal with that given they only have a small acreage to work with are there ways that you could target plantings to accomplish some of each of those i'll give you my first quick thought that i've seen work so many times and we prescribe this a lot and that is to concentrate some of those small openings in, in annuals, as, as I just mentioned. If you have uh, simply crimson clover, for example, which down south is gonna flower in you know, mid to late April, and it's gonna be dead long about early May to mid May for sure. And you also have uh, some wheat or oats in with that, not too much, not, not more than 30 to 40 pounds PLS per acre. And in particular, if you have an armless variety of wheat, as we've talked about a lot, then that wheat also dies in May. And then through the summer, you're going to have a variety of, quote, weeds, and especially various forbs coming up from the seed bank. And that then is going to hold a lot more insects. The turkeys and the deer are going to eat the wheat seed heads. The turkeys also eat the oat seed heads if you planted oats instead. And you can have a nice early successional community right there in those small plots. It's going to be attractive to broods and it's going to have a food source both for broods, adult turkeys, and adult deer. And overall, that's going to be less with regard to maintenance than if you were trying to maintain a perennial plot on that same small acreage yeah the the one thing that uh and maybe because this is so common for for me is dealing with uh properties that at least we think are food limited you know the deer body size is small habitat at a really large scale can't be managed and so we're trying to get as much forage production out of that small acreage on the property as we can throughout the year is uh, exactly what Craig recommended, but then also including a later maturing clover that is also gonna provide forage on into May, June, July, depending on the weather and the type of clover. But uh, real simply, it's also including an arrow leaf, a uh, bursim or a red clover so that and then if they can do warm season plantings too, fantastic, go for it. But more often than not, it's simply going to be getting in there in September, give or take. They're going to do one planting. And so can we provide a window going from October all the way until June with that one cool season planting? So completely agree with uh, Craig. And again, this is from a context of deer and for food limiting. But I would just add that one little tidbit about adding a, a later maturing clover as well to that mix. Well, I think that's an interesting point. You mentioned something else that, that got my mind racing. It, that's what about a, a warm season food plot? If you had an annual moving into an annual warm, an annual cool season moving into an annual warm season, would that be more desirable if you're just strictly interested in deer? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my two cents. But again, Marcus, this all comes back to that, that context. If you only have a few acres or a small percentage of your land, uh, what we really don't want to see is you disking up uh, an actively growing food plot and not have any forage for six weeks to two months to get that warm season planting going. So what I would rather them do is if you had two or three or four or 10 plots is to 
have some plots that are devoted to warm season. A and it works really well if you have that cool season plot with one of these later maturing clovers that's still producing well in May and into June. And then during May, you're at your warm season plot, planning that to a warm season forage. As the warm, as the cool season plot is diminishing, the warm season plot is taking off. And so uh, you, you literally are providing as much forage as you can per your limited area year round. That, that's kind of, you know, if you can game plan it perfect world, that, that's what we would recommend. I, I agree with, with all of that. Um, the only thing that uh, I might throw in there is that usually these areas are small. And so uh, the deer density on most of these sites is gonna be such that you can't get a warm season planting minus perhaps joint vetch that does pretty well with, with grazing pressure uh, to really grow and produce much on those small plots. And so in those examples, we do exactly what Bronson's mentioning. We'll add arrowleaf, balanza, especially arrowleaf, which, you know, arrowleaf is, is good and is uh, producing grazable forage on into uh, uh, at least early July. And the deer little, literally will be eating the, the last leaves and the stems off of it uh, through mid to late July. And, uh, and then of course, adding red, that can get you on in, into August. But if you had a number of those, that's when I would encourage having some of those in, in perennials also, because although it's a perennial cool season planting, the primary production period of those is gonna be late March through July essentially functioning as a warm season food plot. So I would have a combination of annual cool seasons and perennial cool seasons. If I'm limited on a, uh, a lease and I had a number of quote, small plots, that's probably what I would concentrate on more than trying to have a warm season planting because of the restrictions of many of those that they're gonna be you know, grazed out quickly. And when, and, and you said if deer is the primary consideration, if turkeys is the primary consideration, then I'm going to leave out those clovers that will extend on into the summer. That's why I just limited uh, the mixture earlier to crimson because it's going to die earlier because I actually want that germination and growth of the forbs from the seed bank because of the structure that, that they provide for, for those broods, which is really good. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question to you. You know, if if you are interested in turkeys and particularly in making sure there's adequate uh, structure for pulp production, it sounds like that's what you would recommend is to just leave out some of those longer. Uh, yeah, but, but let me also say, I mean, th this pains me. It, it really pains me when I go to properties and, and this is, you know, the restriction. Well, you know, the timber company, they won't let us do anything. And, and you know, a, a lot of them, they don't even thin. I mean, they're having a fair amount of harvest, but uh, the amount of harvesting that they're doing, that is what's driving the wildlife populations on those properties way more than all of these little bitty food plots put together. And so it, it really hurts when you can't get in there and, and actively manage, you know, what we'd call the meat of the property, because these food plots, that's just, that's just dressing, you know, we, you know, the gravy, so to speak. The meat and potatoes is managing the forest or managing the woodlands properly for those focal species. And then also when you're not on a leased property and you have an appreciable amount of, of open land, then managing those fields specifically for deer or turkeys or rabbits or, you know, Bob White, whatever it is that you're most interested in. Yeah, it's a good point. So uh, I guess, Bronson, what along those same lines, what is pretty typical on these, these pine forest areas for the 
the rotation, how much of the acreage is is a recent clear cut where they may get some of these benefits out of it? Gosh, I, I wish I could generalize. Uh, it, it all depends and kind of what we're going through now too. What, what are timber prices? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot more difficult to move wood and to get thinnings right now. But uh, gosh, if, you know, if you're on small acreage and by small, I guess I'm generalizing and saying you got a couple hundred acres, three or 400 acres. I mean, heck, you, you may go 25 years before, you know, you're going to have a, a clear cut on that property. And uh, I guess, Marcus, that really gets to um, lo looking at the landscape, you know, getting on Google Earth and, and seeing what's around you. Uh, a lot of these problems are solved with cover, generating cover. And a lot of good food is, mm -hmm. you know, two to three years post clear cut you have fantastic cover and you have a lot of food. Um, it's just unfortunate for the leaseholder that is completely out of their hands. That's a, uh, that's a silvicultural decision. It's an economic decision and that that's going to happen every couple decades or so. Yeah. Well, uh, there's one thing that this kind of sticking in my head and, and I noticed neither of you have brought it up, but nearly maybe every landowner, but most of them for sure that I that I go and have visited have a supplemental feeding program to some degree. And neither of you have mentioned that, even though we've talked about food production quite a bit. So I was curious if you had any thoughts on supplemental feeding and the role that that would play in this type of landscape. Happy to give my two cents. Can supplemental feeding work and can supplemental feeding increase deer quality? However you want to measure that, whatever you're interested in, most people for antlers, um, you, you have got to put so much context around a statement like this. Can supplemental feeding improve deer quality? Yes, it can, depending on is nutrition limited on the property? If nutrition is not limited, meaning the habitat is already managed very well, you're probably not going to see any improvement. The, the other part of that, and, and this is real world dollars and cents, I almost said never, and I'm scared to say never, rarely, rarely, rarely have I ever been to a place or worked with the landowner, talked with the landowner, where they are supplemental feeding at a scale to which they would improve average diet quality for the deer population at large that's residing some part of the year on their property. And when you think about what you have to do is that literally feeders at uh, one per 100 to 150 acres fed all of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, unless you have a lot of time and money and resources and people to keep that system going, um, I, I don't think you're going to get a return on your investment. I think if you were to quantify the amount of time and money that you would put into maximizing food plots, managing the habitat when you can, managing the deer density and the composition of the herd, I think it's apples and oranges of what kind of return on investment you're going to get. But I'm not going to sit here and say that if done correctly and if nutrition is limited, well, of course, supplemental feeding can improve deer quality, but you have to check a lot of boxes before you would see that. I certainly agree with what Bronson said, and I'll take that a step further. If you're in a landscape where there are uh, openings and, and sunlight is hitting the ground. And so let, let's, let's walk away from the closed canopy pine stand where, where literally as measured, there is not 10 pounds of deer food per acre. Okay. So let's walk away from that and let's get to a property where there are openings. Sunlight is hitting the ground or trees are thinned to the amount that, you know, maybe you got 50% sunlight or whatever coming in. At that point, 
if you look at the nutrition that is available in the plants that then are growing, there's no way you could see an effect from supplemental feed because those plants have the nutrients that deer require in excess of what they are, in excess of the level at which they need them. And so if those plants are available, you shouldn't be surprised that when you put out X number of uh, feeders, well, gosh, if you collected the data and, and nobody does really, uh, <laughs> what was your antler score per age class for the previous five years? And so now that you put out your feeders over this past, you know, three to five years, what is it now? And, and, and that's all you've done. On the flip side, if you change this unproductive vegetation to more productive vegetation, undesirable to desirables, grass to the appropriate forbs, a bunch of tree sprouts and whatnot in the woods to, to more forbs, and of course, you know, sprouts from uh, trees that you've cut, as, as you've well documented, can be uh, highly nutritious. When you have that that's available, the nutrients that are in those plants it's 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 off the charts you know you're talking about crude protein levels that easily are above 20 many of them are above 30 phosphorus levels that are 0.3 to 0.6 uh calcium levels that are way above one percent and at no time does deer need above about 0.5 percent even a doe with uh uh, lactating with fawns. And so having the sunlight on the ground and managing that appropriately then precludes you from needing or seeing an effect of, of feeding. And, and I have worked with so many landowners who have done that and collected data then after they stopped feeding and started managing their woods or fields appropriately. And it's like Shazam. All of a sudden, they see a 10 point increase in uh, antler size per age class. They see doe weights go from 100, 110 pounds to 130, 140. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in, and I'm talking about average per, uh, you know, adult does, whereas you might have some that even are at this latitude, and I'm not talking about Iowa that are, you know, 170 pounds. And so that's outstanding. And that's all easily accomplished without the use of feeders. So uh, we focused a lot on deer with that. What about the supplemental feeding for turkeys? I know a lot of people do that. Is there any, are you reaping any benefit there? Well, if you're doing so, and it's during the hunting season, you're probably doing so illegally. <laughs> Not that anybody ever would put out a corn pile in April. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. I, I challenge you to open a gobbler's crop in April, early May, obviously during the hunting season, and see how many don't have corn in it. It's unbelievable. I mean, property to property to property – these people don't put out corn, but every gobbler that's killed has corn in the crop. And so I think it, it is staggering at the amount of feed that is being placed on the ground, whether we're talking about turkey season or during the deer season. And something that's beginning to get a lot of, of attention and needs a lot more attention is the sublethal effects of some of these toxins and including viruses that are tied to these bait piles and feeding stations that may be causing reduced reproductive output in, in turkeys, whether it be reduced numbers of eggs in the clutch, reduced hatchability, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of places have uh, recorded reduced fecundity rates. And that's reduced number of birds that are ultimately, you know, brought into the fall population, you know, your nest success, your poult survival, et cetera. And so there is 
ample evidence that suggests there are increased and elevated uh, amounts of toxins and, and uh, you know, whether it be fungus, viruses, et cetera, that are in these bait piles that could be causing problems, not just to quote, you know, kill the turkey or uh, other animals, but to have a suppressive effect on the reproductive output. And, uh, you know, that's not my specialty, but I've certainly been reading a fair amount of information on that. And I think it's of great interest. We just and uh, should get a lot more published attention. an article in the Quality Whitetails. We just uh, uh, student finished that up uh, about a month ago and uh, won't go into the, all the specifics of it. But bottom line was that we were surprised the level of aflatoxin in the fall and winter was as low as it was. Uh, so literally kind of going into it thought we would see a lot more greater aflatoxin level in quote deer corn uh, and in the feeders and on the ground in the fall and winter during deer hunting season. Uh, so we were surprised it, it was that low. Equally surprised how high it was during the spring. So when you take that same corn with a very low aflatoxin level uh, and put that on the ground, which during the springtime is the perfect recipe for growing a fungus, is because now we have warmer temperatures, we have humid environment, moisture, et cetera, that I don't remember the numbers, but it was, uh, it was above lethal dose for turkeys at the end of like five days. And so we, and again, like you said, Craig, there, there's a lot of reason, wild, a lot of reasons wildlife die, including turkeys and quail, et cetera, et cetera. But we thought it was very compelling, especially if uh, using corn in the springtime and summer that we, we found definitely a smoking gun for a mechanism of, of uh, where we could have toxicity uh, in turkeys. Well, it sounds like uh, there's a good reason you guys didn't mention supplemental feeding when we were going through all that. <laughs> well, we could chase that rabbit for a long time, but that's not necessarily helping folks who can't use fire and maybe we'd uh, concentrate more on the chainsaw, the disc, uh, absolutely. the sprayer, et cetera. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, the amount of, of uh, money that goes into a supplemental food feeding program uh, might be better saved so that you can buy some land so that you can manipulate all these other things. Um, I'm reminded on, on our podcast, Marcus, on Deer University uh, a couple years ago, and I may be wrong here, but it's about the only study I'm aware of that looked uh, so specifically at the effects of supplemental feed. Uh, so, uh, and this was in South Texas, they did it at a scale that most people can't. And so literally you're doing something here at a scale of, you know, 20 plus thousand acres. You tell them how to feeder every 150 acres at that mm -hmm. type of scale. Uh, you have a team of people keeping those feeders full year round and then you, and then it takes five to ten years before you start seeing an effect. And they did indeed, and they even marked the feed with an isotope, where they could take a tissue sample from the deer, randomly sampled in that area, and they could uh, estimate what proportion of their diet came from the feed versus came from the the range, and they mm -hmm. did that they, they documented about a 10 inch increase in Boone and Crockett score on mature bucks. Now, when I asked the manager, the leader of that, but you know, do you recommend doing this? I remember he said it very jokingly. And it was a great sound bite. He says, it doesn't rain down here. If, if I was in your neck of the woods and it rained, no, I would not do this. You know, this is something we choose to do. I'm not going to say you have to do. We choose to do 
to kind of normalize the boom and the bust of vegetation because out of every five years, you might have two to three or that are in drought conditions and you're not producing forbs. So that is a management action they employ to kind of normalize some nutrition on the landscape. But even after seeing that, you know, that he experienced, documented that amount of increase, he turned right around and said, if it rained where I manage deer, I wouldn't do this. You know, that boom and bust of rain down there is pretty similar yeah. to what we have with acorns up here. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do we do to uh, normalize that? We cut more trees to put more sunlight in there. And then there's no effect from the acorns. whoop de doo <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> A periodic bonus. Enjoy them while you have them to hunt around and don't worry about it. Allow those crowns to expand and uh, enjoy 65% greater acorn production just by releasing those trees that are the producers. There you go. There you go. And that's without fire. That's just a chainsaw and a squirt bottle or just a chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Well, I, I appreciate both of you coming on the show, and I wanted to give you a minute to add anything that you think we may not have covered, and, and also to let people know about where to find you and some of the resources you have available. I'm at the University of Tennessee, and uh, we have all kinds of extension publications as well as research publications that are available. All of that's available on my web page. And um, I guess the only thing that I would say if, if you can't use fire is, is don't worry about it. There's lots of things that you can do to manage your property effectively for your objectives that you can reach without fire. But also don't close your mind to that if you're one that is not using fire because you're tentative to do so. Try to get outside, you know, your comfort zone a little bit. And what I've told people is if you, for example, go into the woods and just scratch out a, you know, like a 30 by 30 foot area with a rake or a blower, start small and burn a small area and get a little bit of experience. And of course, have someone with you who has some experience with fire and continue to read and uh, talk with others who have, have used fire, attend a prescribed fire council meeting in your state or some other workshop that is uh, you know, teaching prescribed fire management and, and put another tool in your toolbox. You don't have to start big and you know, never do you have to burn 50 acres. Um, for the vast majority of people, if they're able to burn, you know, two, two to 10 acres at the time, they're going to be really, really pleased with the results. Um, I would add in Mississippi, don't neglect the, uh, the advice that you can get from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks and their private lands program. Uh, John Grushy loves going out and, and giving advice on, on habitat management. Both of y'all know John, don't you? I don't know. Are you going to give John, are, are you gonna <laughs> give John cell number here on the podcast? <laughs> we'll put and, it and in his, the show notes. <laughs> and his home address. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've got a, you know, whether it be the, from a deer management perspective, the DMAP program, but they have a great private lands program. Uh, so don't neglect those opportunities that are available for you in that regard. Um, in terms of what we have going on, same as Craig mentioned, go to our website, msudeerlab.com, and there's extension publications, research publications are there to, to read more. And then, of course, uh, just like this podcast, Fire University, check out the Deer University podcast for this type of deer management information. Tune in. 
All right. Well, good stuff. Well, we will uh, put some of these links to help direct people to some of those resources in the show notes. But again, guys, really appreciate both of you taking the time. Really a great conversation and informative and, and I appreciate it. Always fun to talk to you. Happy to help Marcus anytime. All right. Till next time. Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University Podcast Network, funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.